So good evening, everyone. We are indeed fortunate to have on our eminent lecture series today, Professor Amod Gupta, who is Professor Emeritus of Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education Research. He's also been the former dean Sir, you can share your slides. I think there is some internet problem from my side. I have already. Uh, can I introduce, sir? Yes, yes ma'am. Again, please. Uh, uh, oh, internet okay. problem, please. Yes. Okay. So, uh, we are really fortunate to have Professor Amod Gupta with us, who is Professor Emeritus of uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh. He has been involved in active research for very long years, and he set up the Advanced Eye Center in PGI. Uh, he's been the head of Department of Ophthalmology for many years and set up centers for biotechnology in Advanced Eye Center. He's a Padma Shri awardee and a very active researcher. And today he's going to talk about publishing Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Menu Singh, for asking me to present this lecture for the telemedicine department. Now, as you rightly said, uh, uh, I spent over 45 years uh, publishing papers, writing papers in academic journals. And the only advice in the initial years I got was, no matter what, you keep writing. You write for any journal that come to your mind or become available. Now, looking back, I wonder if somebody had guided me back then, you know, when I was just initiating my academic career at the PGI, how things might have been different or better for me and for the department and the institute. From the outside world, at least from the point of view of common man on the street and non-academic uh, people, the world of academia looks very glamorous. Uh, you are a faculty member, you're a professor, uh, in, in an institute like PGI or AIMS, uh, we do not realize uh, that the, the world of uh, academia is highly competitive. You may be you know, an excellent physician or a surgeon. When it comes to uh, recruitment, when it comes to your enrollment in the faculty or your promotion, uh, the papers become the proverbial uh, Democles sword. And when you are denied a promotion or uh, a placement in the faculty, it can be highly demotivating for a person. Now, let me tell you a story of this, because we use this uh, term Democles sword so often. But this Democles was a courtier in the, the, the Dionysius, a famous uh, ruler from Syracuse. He used to be a great flatterer. He would like to flatter the king all the time to draw benefits from the king. 
so much so that Dionysius was so sick of this man. He said, well, I'm going to teach him a lesson. And when you look around in your own faculty and look around your own residence, you would find a number of Damocles uh, in your environment. The king was so annoyed. So he, what he did was he invited Damocles to a very lavish banquet in his palace. But when Damocles looked up, he saw a sword hanging by a mere hair of a horse tail. Now this guy lost all appetite, you know, and forgot all about because all the time this sword was hanging on his head. So this is the Damocles sword which hangs on the head all the time on people in the academic world. Do the residents face this sword of Damocles? Yes, thesis is a statutory requirement, but writing a paper is not a requirement, at least in the MDMS courses. How about if you are looking for a faculty position, you know, the first question invariably asked is, what was the subject of your thesis? And did you publish your thesis? And like Damocles, you know, you, you, your, all your aspirations, all your ambitions to be a faculty member in the PGI get put paid right there and then. The moment you have to face that question, did you publish your work? Now you may be nicely settled in faculty position. If your objective of writing or publishing is to gain recognition because you see some of your senior colleagues getting a lot of awards, a lot of recognitions, including the Padma Awards, and perhaps then you are on the wrong track. Awards will follow in a natural course in the wake of your publication, if you've done some significant or substantial work in a field, these will follow, uh, you know, over a period of decades, they will not come in a, uh, in a hurry. Now, if you recall this year's uh, Nobel Award went to David Julius, 24 years after he discovered receptors of pain. So your papers have to showcase your ability to describe what you are able to see and observe, what others can't interpret and use it to change the way the patients are diagnosed, investigated, or managed. In other words, your papers must bring about a change in the behavior of others. It's of course easier said than done. Do they change the guidelines or policies to diagnose or manage? A disease. Now I'll tell you a story. And this is a story was told a long time back. If a, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make sound? Now this question was asked in Scientific American almost 130, 130 years ago. And the answer was given that when a tree falls, it creates a vibration which is appreciated by the ear as a sound. Now, if you are writing papers, but nobody knows that you've written a paper, nobody has read it, nobody has seen it, Nobody has cited it. It simply doesn't exist. You might as well throw that paper into a trash bin for all that it matters. We are very happy, very excited when a paper gets accepted for publication or comes in print or, you know, becomes available online these days. But how do you know your paper have or has met the goal? What was the objective of writing the paper? Has it met it? And what do you do after you manage to publish a paper? In other words, do you track your papers? 
Now, very often, you know, we use the word matrix. Matrix is about measurement. The science is all about measurements. Now, first question is, did your paper reach the intended audience of the readership? Has anybody seen or read your paper, or at least its abstract? Did it have a universal appeal, or it was lost only in your local area, or city, or region? Did people interact? Did they comment? Did somebody write an editorial on that paper? And what was the impact of that paper? Did it change the policies regarding that particular disease? Now, in the past, the metrics were very simple. And the metrics was, they'll tell you what was the subject of your paper, where did you publish your paper, which journal, what type of paper you published, was it an original, original uh, uh, paper, was it a letter to the editor, was it an editorial, was it a review. You know, how many papers you published, the number, simple statistics. And were you consistent or did you start writing just before your promotion came due? Were you consistent in your publishing? And most vital questions, what they noticed, did people across the world take your paper seriously enough to cite them? Now, this was a matrix in the past. And I'll give you an example of that. For the sake of convenience, I have uh, not uh, offending uh, some of my colleagues, uh, in, in medicine, I have chosen my own example here. So very simple statistics is available uh, that shows that, well, I published more than 80% papers in subject of medicine. And what are the journals where I published? So this will immediately, if you if you're making a presentation to a selection committee and if you present data, like this is how I, I published my papers and these were the impact factors of the journals where I have published my papers. And what we have published, articles, conference paper, book chapters, and all those are available now, very simple statistics. And the consistency, were you consistent over the years during the course of your career? Most of the time, this would be when, when you're appearing for the job of a professor or a senior position that you will need to show that you were consistent in publishing your papers. Now, this one is also available. How often were you cited by others? Did your work over the period of years became more relevant? Did you get continue to get more citation, increasingly more as your career progressed? Or people stopped citing your subject, what you were writing about was a dead horse. Nobody was bothered about that subject. Who were the co-authors who have written papers? Because these days, solo papers, single author papers are exceptional. They're very rare. So who were the co-authors with you? Were they consistent with you? Or you change your co-authors every now and then? So these are the statistics available as of now. So with the citations, each year, how many citations did you get? The most important parameter which people talk about and they will ask is what's your H index? That means how many papers got cited as many times uh, in the academic journals. And this is very interesting. The, this curve is very interesting because each point will tell you that this is how many citations your paper number one got. And as you go along the curve, at each point, it'll tell you how many citations uh, each paper or document you got. Of course, we have a table also. Again, a very nice way of telling if you are sitting for the job of a professor or the job of a director of an institute that you can show your impact that you, well, your, your, uh, your research did have an impact uh, on the, in the world of medicine. Now, how about the individual matrix? And I want to introduce using an example of one of my own papers, which we used in uh, 2004. And this is how the world started changing around here, that uh, uh, we started uh, looking at some of these widgets which are inserted into the journal uh, here site. And this is called PlumX matrix. Now, when you click on the PlumX matrix, it will tell you the story of your paper. What does it tell? 
the most important we are worried most of the time it really tells you uh, how big impact it has made uh, if you look at the citations uh, of your papers now when you look at those uh, you know you can have web of science or this is here we taking uh, plum max matrix uses scopus or the elsevier site for this now whether they are cited in scopus or pubmed central uh, these are the two uh, indexes which use citations and you can get across references also from these now very important uh, uh, this is uh, policy citation did this paper get uh, policies uh, making uh, somewhere uh, was involved so it got into a policy document now this is another uh, in interesting information it gives the captures 59 now captures is very very important that means somebody has kept this reference with him and he wants to cite you know uh, in future so it can be a leading indicator that your paper is likely to be cited if you find this the captures or mendeley mendeley same way it's a reference uh, uh, kind of uh, manager and uh, if somebody has kept uh, uh, this your paper or your citation in a in a reference manager like Mendeley, uh, he again intends to use it. That means it has captured the imagination and you can predict that, well, this paper is going to be cited by a number of people. And of course, I told you about the policy. Of course, this is some bibliographic uh, definition here. Now, this is how it looks like Scopus. And you can see, I think one should uh, every time look at your paper and see uh, who's citing your paper and what kind of work is it getting cited? Who are those authors who are citing your work? And in what context? So all this information is available on Scopus or in PubMed Central. The interesting part is that PubMed Central has full length uh, uh, article available. Uh, and uh, if somebody is citing your paper and that full article, a full length uh, PDF is available, it adds to the merit of that. So it's, it's uh, important to be cited in a PubMed Central uh, journal. Now, this is what the policy citations are. Where, where, where did it make a difference? Like this particular paper uh, was uh, in the PubMed Central, the guidelines it got uh, uh, cited as well as somewhere in Chile. I wouldn't have imagined that somebody in, sitting in Chile would make a policy decision based on my paper, but that's what it is. So the ultimate aim when I said, is it making a policy decision? So you should be looking at uh, that as well, because that's a very, very critical, uh, you know, impact of your paper. And same is the Mendeley reference manager. Uh, that means somebody is keeping it in his Mendeley reference manager uh, for future citation, and he's writing something uh, around this subject. Now, if you are accessing directly the PDF of the articles, this information is lost. So you need to be, when you go to the table of contents uh, of a journal or of your own paper or somebody else's journal, you need to look at this full text HTML where this information would be available. Like for this particular paper, we again get the plum uh, X matrix. We also know that this can be shared. So you can share this citation or an article on email, Twitter, and social media. So this is where you can simply, you can tweet this by using this link here uh, to the article. But if you're looking at the PDF uh, directly, this will not be available to you. Now coming to this, if we click this plum X matrix again, then you will see that it will show immediately here that there are the citations and these are the captures. So as I said earlier, that this is what is very, very important because you know that it is generating interest among, uh, even if the citation are less, it's generating enough uh, interest among your uh, readership. Now, still we are falling short. We don't know how many people are actually accessing your article in real time. Has anybody seen or read it? Well, they have captured it. They have kept it on their desktop in a reference manager for future use. But how many have seen, how much interest did it generate? 
And did it have a universal appeal or was there a particular area, geography, where it was noticed? Did people comment on your paper? And of course, we have talked about the impact. Now, this is a very interesting paper, uh, which is association with life, style, and genetic. These are just random papers I picked up, for examples, a genetic risk with incidence of dementia. As you grow old, we are all worried. Is it because of my lifestyle that I'm going to have dementia, or is it, my, is it, is it there a genetic uh, risk for developing dementia? Now, when I look at this now, uh, I access this as it became available new online. And this is, I would recommend that uh, all academic people should uh, subscribe to a uh, table of contents from uh, the major journals, at least, uh, particularly the multi-specialty journals, uh, you have a lot of information. Now you can see, I saw this, uh, access this article uh, within a couple of days of its pub becoming available online. And now you can see very interestingly, it gives you the views, how many people have seen it, clicked on it, or seen the abstract, or seen the full paper. Now you have an audience uh, uh, of a large number of people. Of course, it didn't have, because citations will come as the paper mature. Over a period of time, they will accumulate. You will not get citation unless you are able to, your it's so interesting and impressive subject that you, uh, you, you are able to draw an editorial or two. But by and large, uh, you know, uh, uh, citation take time to appear. But this is what is the most important, all metric, uh, all metric uh, attention score, 965. This is alternative metrics. That is alternative metrics is alternative to the conventional metrics that I've shown you the examples before, how many papers, how many citations, you know, stuff like that, which is more of academic interest. But it doesn't tell us how, how, how much attention your paper is drawn immediately after it got published. Now I'll show you another example. And this is now not in a multidisciplinary uh, uh, journal, but a subset, this is a subset journal of JAMA ophthalmology. And we have a paper, again, a very important uh, uh, subject of open angle glaucoma whether statin use or high cholesterols are associated if can statins prevent the occurrence of open angle glaucoma in those patients who have high serum cholesterol levels. And it had an audience limited given that it is a ophthalmology subspecialty compared to a multidisciplinary journal like JAMA, but it gained a lot of attention, uh, the alternative metrics and I'll come to shortly what is that alternative matrix. And this is the, the again, you will see this altmetric uh, buried here, uh, the, the, the link to this altmetric uh, donut, the color donut, as we call it. And 175 is a score uh, over the course of this talk. I'll tell you what, how you calculate the score. You know, this is 175. That means it's a very, very high scoring uh, article. And there is number of these sources. Now, what are the sources of this? Now, these are the sources from the, like red is for the news media. If you recall, and I'm sure Dr. Minu Singh and Dr. Jinder Singh would call our days, where the, the, the institutes were shy of going to public, going to news media, talking about our research activity, research publication not realizing that it is a public, the tax paying public, which funds most of the research, which gets published in journals. And it used to lie buried in journals and books, deep in libraries all over the world. Nobody knows what you published unless or until somebody got interested 20, 30, 40 years later and wanted to pick up that article and would look around, hunt around for that article to appear. No way, the world has changed now. And this is what I say, the changing paradigm. Because common man, because it affects whatever you do the research, whatever you publish, ultimately the beneficiary is the major stakeholder, the common man, who's going to be impacted by your research. And he must know about it, among all other academic uh, 
people. So we have a number of these media like news outlets, the tweets, the Facebook, you know, the social media, they mention the news tweets in a variety of uh, news media. And of course, the now this, this is very important that what is the geographic? Now, this was a paper relating to the open angle glaucoma and statins and the use of uh, statins in high cholesterol levels. It got major attention here in the United States of America, uh, a little bit here in Saudi Arabia, and uh, you know somewhere in Venezuela and Colombia, and uh, this is Saudi Arabia here and Japan, none and not anywhere else. So there were no active people. Now, when you look at the uh, the who were the people? Now you know that there were at least 1983% of the people, but the common people who uh, access this information through various variety of outlets like media outlets or tweets or Facebook pages. So they are the major stakeholders to know about it. Now another subject, I'm taking an example, again published in an ophthalmology journal, it's a major ophthalmology journal, subspecialty. Now it's talking about children, should they be exposed to outdoor light? And would it prevent the, the progression of myopia or the occurrence of myopia? It's a major, major concern. You know, if there are outdoor activities because people or children are confined to homes, especially these days, but this paper came before the COVID era. And when I, we click on the Plumax, Plumax matrix uh, widget, we find that it draw within a few days you know, 14 citations, a lot of captures here and social media. But it was tweets, it was getting tweeted around. People were tweeting and retweeting this article, okay, to make it or to spread the word around that outdoor activity is, is very, very critical if you want to prevent the occurrence of myopia or prevent the progression of myopia. Now, this is where the message has to go. The researchers have to exploit the social media. They don't have to feel shy of going to the press, to the news media, or tweets, or Facebook, or wherever they could, you know, spread the word. And very quickly, it came into the policy documents. Okay. Now, if it comes in the policy document, that means the the policy makers, the the, the governments are now become a stakeholder in promoting uh, that children should spend time in the outdoor light activity. Coming more recently to this news, there was a major concern, would antibody testing doing serology for COVID antibodies allow people to move freely and there would be less restrictions. If they were positive, they would resist the, resist the uh, infection by uh, coronavirus. But it turned out that a lot of people were interested to read this, to see this article. So many, so much high altimetry. There was a lot of attention to this. Or this article, where people were concerned talking, common people on the TV media, people were talking about the role of dexamethasone. And people are trying a low dose or versus a high dose of dexamethasone. Are they going to be equally effective or are they going to be less effective? And you can see how many people have access the same day more than 50,000 people were looking at this paper and it gained so much attention uh, in, the, in the media. And of course they concluded it makes no difference. So no need to give 12 milligram. Now coming to again, a multidisciplinary paper and you are writing about the role of physiotherapy, whether it will cut down on the long-term opioid use, which is a major concern uh, all over the world. It did get some attention, but nobody got interested in reading it by the time I was uh, uh, looking at this particular paper. Or this paper, very limited appeal in a, of course in JAMA, but in a subspecialty journal, there were no views, no citation of course, uh, because within a matter of few days, I saw this paper and it's very recent. You can see it's uh, available on 28th October. And there's very little attention I mean, people are not worried because this is limited to a very, very specialized field. Or this patient who got a, uh, got a 
uh, infection or uh, inflammation. Again, very little interest among the common people. It doesn't generate mass appeal, doesn't generate any buzz around the paper. Now, as I said earlier, one, the paper that came in 2018, and there were a lot of buzz around that paper. And one came only early this year, to January 21, that children who were confined to the home during COVID, they had a progression of myopia. And look at the number of people. This beats all. 74,000 people immediately accessed this article because every parent in the world was worried about uh, this kind of activity. The children were staying at home. Would it increase the myopia? Yes, it would increase the myopia. It got cited. This was a gene that even in the academic, people started writing about this, uh, about this subject. And it had, unlike any other art metric, 1723, so much attention in the social media uh, it got and people reacted by way of comments. And you can see here the, the colored donut, uh, how various media uh, outlets uh, propagated this, talked about this paper, and it had a spree, spread fairly all over the Americas, North, South, some parts of Africa, India, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, you know, probably the information not available from China, so that's why it's not shown, but it shows you that majority of this was by the public, but so were the scientists and physicians interested in this. So you know, uh, what is this spread? Who are the people who are reacting, who are seeing or reading your paper? So this is all about that buzz about work that you do. Another one was, you know, very limited appeal that what are the ocular side, high side effects of the COVID vaccine? Because that's again a major concern, which is leading to COVID hesitancy. Well, it had some, lot of views, some interest in media. Probably the media was not uh, trying to spread this, but you should develop because it's a federal disease, there's several venous thrombosis. You know, there were no views till that time when I saw, but a lot of media attention. There were a lot of hype created in the news outlets about that people are going to die of cerebral venous thrombosis, not realizing that's a very, very rare side effect of. And of course, this did say in this paper that there was compared to the pre-COVID era, there was five time increase in the incidence of cerebral venous thrombosis in women. But what draw the attention was this research letter, not even an original article, where they raised doubt that the COVID uh, vaccine was causing acute myocarditis, of course, not fatal, but required some treatment and hospitalization, not ICU care. Look at the number of people who access this immediately, they're worried. Young people getting vaccine, are they going to get acute myocarditis? They wanted to see the, the wanted to see the, the the, what the paper says, what the science was. So this had a lot of attention, a lot of comments uh, immediately after. And look at this now, it's a universal, it's a major concern. And I believe this probably, this was a paper which led to vaccine hesitancy uh, all over the world. So this is how your, your papers or research impacts the whole world practically in real time nowadays. And this is what it shows, how it was accessed by physicians, members of public and all. Now, these are the various, uh, you know, uh, social media which have their interfaces, uh, which are, you know, which are the applications uh, and uh, the programming interfaces so that automatically uh, these are drawn. So I'll come to that later. And the score is a weighted count in altmetric like news is a widespread media, so it gets eight, blogs get five, policy documents get three and like that down the list, you know, uh, to YouTube and the number of mental editors and all that. So it's a cumulative uh, figure which comes from the attention, uh, alt matrix attention score. And these are all color coded for the donut which I've shown you. How do I attract attention? So you, you need to go out to the blogs or you know somebody who blogs to give your link to your paper or your research. And you, you know, link in your email signatures because that is where it will capture. So when you are writing emails to your friends, you put down in your email signatures, you put down a link, DOI, I'm sure you know, DOI, most of you at least in a way. And share links. 
you know, wherever, okay, and make it available. You know, that is where you are writing on Facebook, you're sharing, you're liking it, you're tweeting about it, you know, uh, and this is high time institutes like PGI, I'm not sure what aims, but PGI doesn't have its Twitter handle. It doesn't have perhaps its Facebook. It doesn't have any social media account. Publishing more than a thousand papers in a year, I think it makes a lot of sense to have this social media and go out. At least you will have one or two papers every day to tweet. And I see a lot of, lot of uh, uh, at least uh, very prominent eye centers of the US uh, tweeting every day about their participation in meetings, their residents presenting papers, their papers that get published, the, the awards their faculty got, the lectures they have delivered. So all that is tweeted and retweeted to create a buzz around the work. You see, just law, justice not has, only has to be done, it has to be seen to be done. It has been perceived by common man to be done. So is your research. Not only is it done honestly, but it needs to be seen. It needs to be perceived by the major stakeholders that is a common man. That is the changing paradigm. Always link to a page that includes your uh, unique ID like DOI and uh, it has to be in the main body. From that's where it will uh, draw that link would be uh, picked up by these interfaces with the social media. Few last words, uh, uh, one has to be aware that the higher you climb, the harder you fall. And this is a paper in example. Reasonably high altmetric score, a lot of views, and it says old women who get cataract surgery die early. You can imagine the kind of uh, uh, panic it created all over the world. And it had a altmetric score of 712 and the donut show multicolored. So all kind of variety of media spread this uh, around the world. And you can see the, again, the universal appeal. Old people don't get cataract surgery done. That was the message given by this paper. And this paper got retracted because of false data, false interpretation of data. Now, unfortunately, what happens is when this gets withdrawn, the attention it gets is very little. People don't talk much about attention to something which was wrong. Very few people looked at it. And it gives a notice that it has been retracted. This is drawn today. I saw that still has a lot of media buzz, the word views, but finally, you know, it got seen, but not much. It didn't have the same buzz uh, when, when somebody came out and said, well, this was wrong, we are sorry. This was wrong interpretation of data. Old women after cataract surgery don't die early. So my friends, uh, uh, to summarize uh, what I have just shown you, how the world is changing, how it is reacting to your research and your publication papers. Unless your papers get seen practically in real time, within days of its publication, they get traction, they get mentioned, they get abstracted, they get indexed. There's no point wasting your time and effort. It'll be just a mere statistic. Nobody in the world is bothered about your statistics. They'll be sure to do you some good when it comes to promotion, but when it comes to an institute, when it comes to an India, when it comes to Indian uh, science or medical sciences in particular, you know, nobody is bothered about because your papers did not create buzz because you did not create that buzz around work. Okay. You must track your papers to know. You know, it helps me when I track my papers, I know which papers I can counsel people. I know precisely, you know, almost 25 to 30% of the papers never got cited. And I should be wasting time. If you can, early in your course of your career, if you can spot what are those papers which are not getting traction, which nobody is interested in the world to look at, why should you be spending time and energy writing those papers? But what are those areas which are getting policy, uh, getting into policy documents? or which are creating a bus around where the world is paying attention to what you're saying. 
I think I have given you some cues how you can use the digital platform now level to enhance visibility of your work. But you have to be at the same time aware you're never, never going to succeed. You are leaving digital footprints. They are not going to leave you. They are not going to leave you. So beware of faking your papers, fabricating your data or false research. Just because you are chasing name and fame, they will of course come to all of you, uh, you know, in due course, if you have done a remarkable work. Thank you very much, Dr. Minu and the telemedicine unit of PGI for this opportunity to share my thoughts on this subject. Thank you very much, sir for such a brilliant talk on this very important topic. And I think you've really uh, shaken the minds of uh, a lot of researchers uh, who would be thinking that, uh, okay, we are publishing, but where are these publications taking us? And in the last uh, two years during the COVID time, and a lot of people have been talking about research-based that a lot, so many papers were published. In fact, every day, many papers were being published on COVID, like starting from systematic reviews, rapid reviews. Now trials are coming up, which, are, which they're saying are very small number, uh, small sample size, poor quality uh, trials, which are trying to get into practice actually, and also into policy at times. Uh, and a very important example is that of ivermectin which was uh, initially recommended to be of a, of a great use. And later on, when systematically the research was evaluated, it was found that uh, it was not uh, effective in those kind of situations when properly the outcomes were addressed. So uh, it's, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right, sir, that we also have to be smart enough to take our papers to their right uh, place and to their right conclusion, as you have shown that these days, it is easy with availability of IT to have visibility to your research. And uh, Twitter is actually becoming, I mean, there, there was a paper which was published on Twitter that uh, how important, there's a systematic review on that, yeah. that how Twitter has helped uh, people to uh, further their research and bring their research to light. So you're absolutely right that uh, we should follow the right path. And uh, we should not always get uh, enamored by, you know, that we, we should be getting visibility, but what we show should also be of very high quality. Yeah. So there were some questions in the chat box, sir. Uh, one was, uh, which one is better, like uh, Google Scholar or Scopus uh, as a citation? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think, think that is something which is... Uh, I think uh, I've been looking at that and Google Scholar uh, is not a very uh, valid tool uh, compared to scope scientific, yeah. scientific because you will yeah. find a lot of duplications, a lot of duplications. You will find uh, even the conference papers, your book chapters and stuff, wherever anything is published, probably even if I go down to the level of newspaper, uh, you know, it'll show up as a, yeah. a Google Scholar citation. So the most standard people world over now believe is uh, the Scopus because it is a huge uh, database uh, uh, of something uh, close to 22,000 journals, which it, uh, uh, you know, uh, indexes and uh, uh, God knows more than 22 million papers in its uh, database, which it indexes compared to Web of Science, uh, which has uh, been the previous uh, uh, by, uh, you know, Clarivate Analytics. Uh, there, I think the number of uh, journals they uh, search is just limited, 11,000. And uh, the number of papers in their kitty is one-tenth, uh, I believe, just a couple of million papers they uh, look at. Uh, but uh, sure enough, these are the two uh, major uh, citation indexes, but Google Scholar, no serious uh, uh, scientists would be looking at Google Scholar, you know. So, uh, of course, Google search is improving these days compared to, uh, you know, PubMed, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, one can always try that if you get a uh, reference, if you're looking for one through Google search, uh, but I'm not sure about Google Scholar as much. Yes, sir. Dr. Ketan wanted to know whether every paper or publication can get an altmetric index. 
it can get what in, uh, impact? All all metric index. Oh yes, yes, Something yes. Most of the papers that are published get alt metric zero. Yeah. No, they are getting a big zero because we are not publishing on social media. We are not giving providing a link because we have to provide the link. You know, some of these uh, journals, uh, major journals like Elsevier journals or uh, you know, uh, like Dama its own public charms, uh, they they uh, embed these widgets like plum X metrics as well as uh, uh, analytic uh, this uh, you know uh, or uh, uh, this you know uh, into the into the headline into the uh, uh, you know the brief abstract where they are giving they provide that arc metric underscore underlined you know and you click on that and they'll give you that uh, alt metric uh, uh, donut you know but unless you have a presence unless if there is a one or two or score five it will certainly come so that's what i've shown you but like earlier papers which i've shown because these have kind of immediacy impact like social media the papers which i had shown you 2003 for my own papers they didn't have any social media presence they will not become relevant social media 15 20 years after the they were published because there was no such available the plum x metrics is available it gives you the more citations the captures which are more relevant to scientists than the the common people but for old papers it will not show the social media presence on tweets or they didn't exist you know the facebook and the the newspaper uh, or uh, there were no automation in uh, linking uh, through these interfaces with the social media and with these uh, you know uh, companies uh, like Plum X, uh, Plum X, and uh, the uh, the uh, other uh, uh, talking alt alternative, uh, you know, metrics or metric. So these are the big time companies which are doing this job only, uh, you know, uh, providing you these uh, impacts. Sir Madhuri Devaraj, you wanted to know. Uh, Madhuri, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Because uh, this is more like a comment. And the comment was that uh, sometimes the researchers are just publishing their findings. And, uh, you know, like they're simply reporting their findings. But uh, actually, uh, it creates a major controversy, for example, with the vaccine hesitancy paper. Yes. So, like, whose fault is this? Is it something like, is it your fault, or is it just that that idea? See, is a, at that time? I think that's a it's a conflict zone. As a scientist, as a medical scientist, it is our bounden duty if we are watching, observing something, some phenomena, be it say cerebral venous thrombosis or myocarditis, or people are getting say ocular changes, or they are getting in the lungs. So, as a scientist, we need to be. Uh, need to be, uh, uh, you know, reporting these, but we have to be very, very careful that we build our case uh, based on scientific observations, complete with uh, very, very standardized controls, and then put forward. Uh, so half baked, like most of the research in FID was half baked. Most of the papers, the number of papers got, which got withdrawn during the COVID era, probably said got breaking number of paper withdrawn yeah. because of immature uh, people, everybody rushing, you know, everybody had nothing else to do, but rushing to the uh, publishers and editors were too happy to publish. I mean, they were, they, they were in that kind of a mood to publish whatever. So I think uh, it remained that whether we should prematurely, but at the same time, we need to make sure that no wrong message goes, uh, which leads to a situation like uh, vaccine hesitancy. I think it's a very, very, a serious side effect, as I brought out, you know, of uh, using these uh, media. But nowadays, if you publish in a paper, it will automatically get, whether you like it or not, it will get extracted uh, by the widgets. Uh, Dr. Manli wants to know, uh, sir, when it comes to utilizing research, what is your opinion on using platforms like SkyHub, which has a controversial legal status? I mean, these are some of the services which were available and we could make uh, people available, some of the 
research articles, which otherwise they were not uh, allowed to act because the journals didn't have open access policy. Yeah. So people just started collecting these uh, articles and they were made available. And there were some Russian people I think who were involved in this. And then there was a big legal controversy in India about this. What type of there's a question by Dr. Vivek Singh. Is it good to write? Uh, we need to update our CV in terms of views, articles, access numbers, and online attention. That means the ultimate metric score yes. in our publication. Absolutely. In, Absolutely. in your CV, yeah. you must give that. And for your presentation, when you're sitting for an interview, you must present that. These days, uh, you know, everybody is talking about their work. Who else is going to talk about your work? Yeah. I think, sir, you really made some uh, excellent suggestions to our researchers who have joined uh, today. And I think we also need to look, this is something which we should know right in the beginning of our careers, that yes. this is a track we have to follow right. rather than uh, just going on doing research and uh, again, getting nowhere. So, I think the title which you chose for your talk was something which will become, uh, you know, something to use uh, very commonly. Uh, Dr. Amrit, are there any, uh, any questions on the YouTube? Uh, no, ma'am, uh, there is no questions on YouTube. Uh, Dr. Pankaj, uh, Pankaj or Dr. Amit? Yes, sir. Sir, it seems uh, there are no questions. Or... Yeah. Okay. Dr. Siddharth, would you have to say anything? You recently got a recognition in US College of Rheumatology for your paper. It was, it was a pleasure listening Dr. to Dr. Siddharth, sir. you were sitting quiet. Would you like to say something? It was a pleasure something? listening to Sir's talk, ma'am. Hey, sir, I was not He's aware of, of a lot of I was not aware of a lot of things that sir mentioned, so it was very insightful for me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for addressing thank the you. researchers today. Thank and you. Uh, thank you, we would love to have you again on our sessions because we know that something like this would be really useful. Yeah, thank you. For, uh, our, our students and residents. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.